from Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Deller. Earl Foreman, Johnny. In Sarasota? That's right. Florida? <laughs> Where else? Well, hi, Earl. How are things in the land of infernal sunshine? What do you mean, infernal? Well, it's getting pretty hot down there these days, isn't it? Makes good fishing weather, Johnny. Yeah, but without a case to work on, what possible excuse would I have? Maybe I have one for you. Oh? Yeah, and maybe it's murder. Earl, I'll be down on the next plane. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Tri-State Life and Casualty Company Branch Office, Sarasota, Florida. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Parley Barron matter. Expense account item one, $131.50, transportation and incidentals to Sarasota, Florida. Knowing Earl Poorman, I didn't bother checking into a hotel, but instead took a cab to his office in the Conroy building. Tall, lanky, easygoing, he welcomed me like a long-lost brother. Oh, Johnny, you're looking great. And I'm glad you're here, because you can clear up this case in a hurry, and then you and I can get out in the Gulf and do some real serious fishing. Oh, well, that's okay by me, Earl. Your last now, trip just... down here, you remember, they weren't biting so good. But, oh, Johnny, so help me now that... Oh, I see you've got your bags with you. Well, uh, yeah. Good, I, uh... because you're going to stay with us out the house. Now, I'm not going to take any argument. I told that old battle axe I'm married to to hang out an extra towel for you. How is my... Oh, she's great, just great. I never did understand how I was lucky enough to grab that dame, Johnny. Oh, well, now, I think maybe she kind of cares for you, too, Earl. Right? <laughs> now, uh, about yeah, why women we call... show funny tastes sometimes. Hey, maybe the old horse will go fishing with us. Mike? Yeah. Anything over 10 pounds, it'd pull her right out of the boat. <laughs> but now, what kind Listen, of a problem... she's been getting pretty good with a rod and reel. Look, look, will you? This fishing uh, talk is just making my mouth water. First, I'd, we'd yes, better discuss... Yes, I, I, I know. Once I get started on fishing... I know. It's... All right, now. Let's it's... get down to cases, huh? Oh, all right, if you insist. I insist. Yeah, all right. Okay. I was just trying to stall off having to. You know where Lido Key is? Lido? Yeah, a mile or so offshore, ju just beyond St. Armand's Key, where we live. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, a client of mine, a man I've known for years. He retired, bought himself a piece of property there, built a nice little home on it. H his name is Parley Barron. So? Well, I've handled all his insurance for him, including a straight life at 50000 Uh-huh. Beneficiary? His wife, Flora Barron. And what's happened to him? Well, Friday morning, now that's the day before yesterday, he left the house just to do some errands. Well, go on. Yeah, well, he hadn't got back home by about 5 p.m., and his wife started calling around, trying to find out where he was, and nobody seemed to know. So finally, she put in a call to the police. Who's your man there? Uh, Sergeant Harry Brackett. Oh, I remember him. Sure. Go on. Well, then around 7 p.m., they found Barron's car. Found it parked down by one of the fishing docks. But no sign of him? Not a sign, not then or since. Had he gone out fishing? Police questioned everybody, the boat owners, all the boat delivery, everybody. Old Will Bright, who runs the dock where the car was parked, he was closed up. Sign on the door saying he'd gone up to Gainesville. Well, could Barron have had any reason to disappear? Oh, no, no. Well, not that anyone knows of. What kind of a person is his wife? You know, you know she's very sweet, Johnny. She's a bit of a bore. But, oh, they doted on each other. All right, how about enemies? Parley Barron? Never. Sweet old guy. I sure hope you can find him. I, that he's still alive. I'm afraid I'd, I doubt it. Well, so far you've given me no reason to believe he's dead. Well, it's just a feeling, I guess. And I don't like it. Mm. Well, what else can you tell me, Earl? Nothing, really. Then maybe I'd better talk to Mrs. Barron and to the police. Yeah, yeah. Oh, here. You take my car. Oh, thanks. It's the new air-conditioned cat out in the back of the building. Well, what did you do? Oh, Michael picked me up. We'll see you at the house for dinner, huh? Well, that may depend on what I find out in the meantime. Whenever though. you're ready, there's food and there's a bed waiting for you. And uh, I hope you... Well, I just hope you find Parley Barron. Pretty good friend of yours, isn't he? Oh, yeah, Johnny. He was. Earl seemed so sure that Barron was dead. I was pretty down in the mouth about it. 
But I wondered, did he know something about the old man that he hadn't told me? Ah, that didn't seem like Earl. He gave me the Baron's address on Lido Key, and I drove out there. Laura Barron was a fragile, gray-haired little old lady wearing steel-rimmed spectacles and with, well, with almost a sanctimonious air about her. She sat primly, properly straight in her chair as we talked, a Bible in her hand. Then Mr. Earl Poorman has told you as much as any of us knows, Mr. Dollar. I see. But uh, even the smallest bit of information may hold the key to finding your husband. Only prayer can help us now, Mr. Dollar, or help him if he's gone to the great beyond. How, uh... Well, tell me, how is he dressed on Friday morning when you last saw him? As you see him in the picture there on the table in old gray pants and a rather tattered sport shirt and that old straw hat. That shirt is blue? Yes. He was so happy the day that picture was taken. He'd just finished making an addition to our dock with his own two hands. He was so proud. Now... Yes, I, I'm sorry. He'd hoped to get his own little boat, too, for fishing. He loved to fish so. Yes, well, uh, tell me, please, do you know of anyone who might have wanted to harm your husband? Oh, dear, no. No, Mr. Dollar. And you'd had no... no argument or disagreement with him before he left here that morning? Huh? We had had no disagreement even about little things in 41 years of blessed marriage. Ah. Not even about his work. I see. Uh, what did he do before he returned, Mrs. Barrett? Oh, I, I had hoped you wouldn't ask that because I... I've always felt that the good Lord wouldn't approve. Of his work? I'm a very religious woman, Mr. Dollar, and as I say, in 41 years, we never questioned one another's thoughts or actions. But... What was your husband's work? I, I won't say that it was sinful, because he wasn't a sinful man. Polly was a good man, and many times he made it plain that his work helped to save lives, too. And I accepted it because he felt he was doing right. Yeah, well, you still yeah. haven't told me, Mrs. Barron. That... Always deep in my heart, Mr. Dollar. Yes. Have you thought that perhaps it may have been the intercession of divine providence that has taken Parley from us? Uh, <clears throat> no. But no, you I... must consider it, mustn't you? Because the workings of the power that guides our destinies, our birth and our Mrs. death... Mrs. Barron... They are sometimes too mysterious for us mortals fully to comprehend, much less question. Well... And so, if my beloved Parley has been taken from us for some divine purpose or for something he might have done unknowing that was not in accord with the supreme Mrs. will. Mrs. Barron, I'm sorry, but I would like to know what your husband's work was. I know, and perhaps it was my humble mission on earth, the cross I had to bear to guide him away from it to <sighs> chemicals. He was a chemist, Mr. Dollar. Explosives. Explosives? Yes. Heaven, please forgive me for not having led him into some other field. Where did he work? Tampa. Dufresne Chemical Corporation. Dufresne. Oh, yes, I've heard of it. Explosive things to kill in defiance of the Almighty's purpose that we love one another. Yeah, but we... now how, uh, how long ago was this? He retired in 1951. And since then? Here in Sarasota. Uh -huh. And to keep himself occupied? Oh, this lovely home of ours and his fishing... Though he never caught anything. Oh, I see. Never caught anything, Mr. Dollar. Do you suppose that that was some retribution for the work he had done so long, for some error in his living or thinking? Well, I... <laughs> well, who knows, of course. Yes, who knows. But we should consider it, shouldn't we? Uh, uh, where did he do his fishing? He never told me. But he left here almost every day to try his skill. And always he came home empty-handed. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> well, thanks, uh, Mrs. Barron. I'm sorry to have had to ask you so many questions. It's all right, Mr. Dollar. My faith will sustain me through this ordeal. I'm sure it will. Thanks again. Here, you must take some of these pamphlets with them. Oh, Read them. Uh... Any aid to piety of the mind is good for all of us. Yes, well, thanks. I... The inspired word may help us all. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks very much. I like to think that on the whole, I... Well, maybe I'm not too religious in the sense of going to church regularly and that sort of thing, but well, at least I try to live a decent sort of life and observe the golden rule and stick to some ideals, and... But in an atmosphere like that, well, I couldn't help wondering if her husband didn't have good reason for wanting to get away for a while. 
In any event, I'd got nowhere on the case, so I phoned Sergeant Harry Brackett. That's item two, ten cents. But the desk at headquarters said he wouldn't be back until about 6 p.m. And since I really had nothing to go on until I could see him, I dropped in on Earl again. You kidding? Then we'll take the boat, run out into the Gulf, and get some fish for dinner. It's the best time of day. So who was I to refuse? And within the hour, we were fighting the tide through the pass between Lido and Longboat Keys on our way along into the Gulf. Yeah, Johnny, I find I always have my best luck along about this time of day, just before sundown. I still ought to be back there working. Why? Sergeant Brackett won't be back at headquarters until 6 o'clock. You told me yourself. Now, what can you do until you talk to him and find out what leads he may have? Oh, man, you are a funny one. You call (laughs) me long distance to get down in a hurry, then insist I go fishing instead of working. Don't you know? Fishing's the answer to more problems than anything else in the world. You got worries? Go fishing. You'll forget them. Got a nagging wife? Oh, don't let Mike hear you say that. (laughs) Well, she's different. You little shrimp. But you know what I mean. A writer, he wants ideas, he goes fishing. A businessman, a detective, huh? I go ahead and say it, an insurance investigator. <laughs> sure. I'll bet that more than once when you've been stumped on a case, why, if you had just relaxed your mind by going out somewhere and wetting a line... I wish it were that easy. And so far as this matter is concerned, I haven't even got started on it yet. Well, relax, anyway. Who knows? Maybe the answer to what's happened to poor old Parley Barron will... will... Well, who just come to you. Oh, yeah, sure. Oh, sure, sure. Instead of you chasing Earl. Him. Huh? Yeah? Up ahead, just to the right there. Where? Oh, yeah. Somebody's old beat-up straw hat. Yeah, and a little further. You know something? The tide will carry that skimmer right smack into the Earl, sea look. And if the fellow that lost look, it knows... Look, further what? over to the right. Huh? What is that floating there? I don't know. Well, that looks like... Oh, good Lord. Johnny... It's a body, Johnny. We'll drift over to it. It's a body, all right. And that straw hat looks exactly like one I saw in a picture this afternoon. Here. I got it. Can you reach him, Johnny? Yeah. Yeah. Here we go now. Oh, good boy. All right, now let's see. Oh. Is it? Yeah. Are you sure, Earl? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Johnny, it's... Poor old Parley Barron. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. Everyone loves kids, and every kid loves candy. American servicemen have heard the tearful cries for candy in most parts of the world, in Europe and the Far East during World War II and after. And there's never seemed to be enough candy to go around. Well, more than a dozen years ago, during the Berlin airlift, an Air Force lieutenant from the United States discovered he had no candy to offer some German children. However, he promised to drop them some candy the next day as he came in for a landing. Improvising a parachute out of his handkerchief, Lieutenant Gail Halverson dropped the candy bars the next day as he had promised. This idea caught on among other Air Force men in the airlift, and that's how Operation Little Vittles began. The idea spread far and wide, and soon military personnel, civilians, business firms began to aid the goodwill program by supplying candy and handkerchiefs. Time after time, as the sleek cargo planes of the United States Air Force swooped low over the landing field, a shower of little bundles of sweets dotted the sky as their tiny parachutes carried them safely to the ground. And the hungry German children gathered up these bundles of mercy, which the communists try to keep from them. The men of the United States Air Force did a great job satisfying a lot of appetites, but they did more. By a wonderful sense of understanding, they nourished the cause of freedom, the right of all men and children everywhere. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Parley Baron Matter. Two days' exposure to the elements and the creatures of the sea had made almost unrecognizable a body that Earl Poorman and I found floating in the Gulf of Mexico off Sarasota, Florida. But Earl was certain it was the remains of old Parley Barron, who had disappeared two days before. 
The men on duty at police headquarters confirmed the identification and placed the body in the morgue to await the autopsy surgeon. On a hunch, I asked Earl to drive me over to Wilbright's boat dock, where Barron's car had been left parked. Looks like I just finished telling the police over the telephone. I wasn't here when poor old Barron come for his boat on Friday. Oh, what a shame, such a nice old man. Where were you, Mr. Bright? I was up to Gainesville, picking up some fishing tackle from a wholesaler. Well, then Mr. Barron must have got a boat from someone else that morning. Oh, no, 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 sir. No? no? Poor, no, sir. Why not, Mr. Bright? Oh, he never took out a boat from anybody else but me. His own boat. Uh, at least it was the one I kept set aside for him. And that's what kind of puzzled me, Mr. Dollar, is it? That's right. Well, you see, when I come back here Saturday night, his boat was right here at the dock. But it weren't tied up in its usual spot where I always tie it up. Somebody had moved it. Must have. And it weren't my helper, Pete. You know, Johnny, that means he may have taken it out, but whoever did him in returned it. Oh, possibly. Mr. Bright, which one is his boat? Oh, right here. I'll show you. I always give him the same one. Never let nobody else use it. That's why he kept his fishing tackle just laying in it, always ready to use. Here. Yeah, I see. I've heard he wasn't a very good fisherman. No, no, he never brought in the thing. Of course, maybe he was so soft-hearted he put back everything he caught. Or maybe his daily excursions were just to get away from his wife, Mr. Bright. Now, don't you say nothing against her, mister. Maybe she is a little touched on religion. Sure, she tries a different kind every couple of months. But she's a fine woman, uh, just like he was a fine man. And everybody knows it. Yeah. The whole town is mourning him. Excuse me. What are you looking for, Johnny? Earl, I just noticed something about this tackle lying in the boat. Mm-hmm. Well? Come on. Thanks a lot, Mr. Bright. I'd like to tell you what I think might have happened. Yeah, maybe later. Thanks. Well, what did you what did you find there, Johnny? Earl, did Parley Barron ever go fishing with you? You were good friends. No, no. He always wanted to go out alone. Yeah, but not to fish. Huh? That tackle box hasn't been moved in months. The paint is still dark under it. What? And that reel, I could hardly turn it. Well, then what? I don't know what. But Barron was using that boat every day for something besides fishing. Any ideas? You know him pretty well, have you? No. Let's get over to headquarters. Earl felt he ought to go back to his office where his wife, Mike, had promised to pick him up, so I borrowed his car again and went over to headquarters alone. Sergeant Harry Brackett, who was assigned to the case, had returned. It was on the phone when I walked in on him. He gets back to town, Mrs. Dana, so please have him call me immediately, will you? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, sir, what can... Johnny. Yeah, hi, Harry. Yeah, Johnny, I'm sure glad you're here. I got a real mixed-up case on my hands. The Farley Barron matter, huh? Well, you know about it? That's why I came to Sarasota. Earl Foreman called me. Have you found out anything? Not that much of you. Well, only what's here, the autopsy report. What's in it, Harry? Doc Snowden says that Farley Barron was dead before he was put into the water out there in the Gulf. Oh? No water in the lungs, you see what I mean? It probably means murder. Have you told anybody this? No, not yet. Why not? Well, I don't know. Maybe because I just can't figure anybody in the world would want to kill Parley Barron. Did you talk with Will Bright down at the boat dock? Just before you came in. You know, it sounds like somebody went with Barron in his skiff that morning. Killed him, dumped him over the side, and then brought the boat back alone, doesn't it? Yeah, except for one thing. Pete Marino, a little kid who plays around Bright's dock all the time, is sort of a self-appointed caretaker when Bright isn't there. What about him? Well, Peter saw Mr. Byron take off in his skiff Friday morning alone. But he didn't see him come back. Pete went home for lunch when he got back to the dock skiff was in. Uh-huh. Then whoever did it met him out on the water somewhere. Maybe several people, so that one of them could return the skiff. He'd be taking an awful chance, wouldn't it? Well, how do you mean? Yeah, Doc's in a pretty isolated spot, all right, but the killer showing up in Baron's skiff without the old man long, that's too much of a chance. How else could it be returned? <sighs> Tied. Tied? Little Pete says that when he got back to Doc, the skiff was there, all right, but not in his usual place. So Will Bright mentioned. Also, it wasn't tied up. It was just sitting there. Oh, then you meant untied. No, I meant T-I-D-E. When the tide's rising, it floats everything from the pass between Lido and Longboat Keys right up to Will's dock. You think the boat just floated back by itself? You got a better idea? Harry. Yeah? Are you sure it was Baron's body we picked up out there? After all, the fish and whatnot disfigured it pretty badly. Johnny, I've known him for years, and didn't Earl Pullman recognize him immediately? Yeah. And the clothes he was wearing, his own straw hat? Well, have you checked on his dental work, things like that? I'm waiting now for Dr. Dana. He was his dentist to get back to... You know, that's a funny thing. What? I called Dana the minute that body was brought in. Yeah. After all, teeth are about as solid identification as you can get. Oh, I thought you were sure anyway. Well, I wanted to be doubly sure. 
Anyhow, when Dana didn't get here right away, I called him again. I got his wife on the phone, and according to her, he suddenly left for Tampa. Urgent call or something. Where in Tampa? She didn't know. At least she wouldn't say, but it, it seems kind of fishy to me. Well, it may just be that one of his patients... Dana. That's right. The man who got so much publicity about atomic radiation studies, effects on the teeth and so on. That's the one. What's the matter, Johnny? Well, when you stumped on a case, says Earl Pullman, go fishing. We did. We found a body. What are you getting at? Me, when I'm stumped, I play my hunches, no matter how crazy they may seem. And the hunch I have right now, man, is the craziest. I'll see you later. I learned a long time ago in this business, when you got a hunch on the line, you play it for all it's worth. Item three, ten cents for a phone call from a booth in the drugstore just around the corner. Hello? Hello, Mrs. Dana? Uh, yes, this is Mrs. Dana. My name is Larkin, Mrs. Dana, from the Federal Bureau. Uh, the Federal Bureau? That's right, so you can see why it's important you say nothing to anyone about this call. Well, how can I be sure you I'm are? simply checking to make sure your husband has followed instructions. Oh, I see. Has he left for Tampa? Why, yes, the minute he got the phone call. Did he tell you who called? Why, no, but I did hear him mention the name Dufresne. Dufresne? Yes, only he didn't know I heard. And, oh, maybe I shouldn't have mentioned it. Just be sure you don't mention it to anyone else. Oh, no. Goodbye. <laughs> Item 4, 390, at the sign of the Flying Red Horse on the way to Tampa. The least I could do for the use of Earl's car was fill the gas tank. On expense account, of course. The FBI gag had worked before, so I used it again to bowl my way through the gate at Dufresne Chemical Corporation and to the office suite of Dufresne himself. I wasn't at all surprised to see activity in the suite despite the late hour. Sir, are you the man the front gate just called about? Yes, that's right, FBI. Which is the door to Mr. Dufresne's office? Well, I'm afraid he has some people with him, sir. What did you say your name is? Never mind. Is this the door? Oh, sir, please, you'll have to wait. Come in, Mr. Dollar, come in. Oh. I'm Arnold Dufresne. This is Dr. Dana, and this is Mr. McLaughlin of the Federal Bureau. How are you? We've been expecting you. Oh, uh, have you? Sit down, Dollar. I guess this is your show now, McLaughlin. My credentials, Mr. Dollar. First, I suppose I should prefer charges against you for impersonating a member of the Bureau. Uh, yeah, well, I... I can uh... hardly say that I blame you, though, under the circumstances. Incidentally, our man in Sarasota's had quite a time keeping track of you. You mean... There was a tail on me? From the moment you arrived. No kidding. Well, we didn't dare take the chance that you might upset things for us. After all, you've a reputation for being pretty sharp. We should have anticipated that you might be called in on the case, but though we planned things very carefully, we, uh, well, shall we say, overlooked you, even as we almost slipped up with Dr. Dana here, who would identify that body. Look, will you please tell me what this is all about? A man named Poorman called you in Hartford and asked that you come here to investigate the disappearance of his old friend and client, Parley Barron, right? Yeah, that's right. Now, where is he? What happened to Barron? Do you know? We do. And we were afraid you might find out and let the, uh, shall we say, cat out of the bag. That is why we were all ready to send for you to come here, but, well, as it turned out, you came all by yourself. Uh, Mr. McLeod. Parley Barron, by the way, Mr. Dollar, is all right, alive, healthy, and happy. Then that body we picked up? Dressed in his clothes? Well, during the last war, Mr. Barron, as a research chemist, made vitally important contributions to our, or shall we say, national security. Oh. He was too valuable a man to lose, even though his wife objected to his work for religious reasons. Uh, yeah, I uh, gather that from talking to her. Or perhaps you even thought she might somehow be implicated in his disappearance. Uh, the thought certainly entered my mind. Well, in any event, so that he could continue to have a happy home and at the same time carry on his tremendously important work, we arranged for the little deception that has been going on for some years now. His so-called daily fishing trips. That's right. But each morning in a small hidden cove, I needn't tell you where, he was picked up and brought here to Tampa to carry on his work. Well, I'll be done. No one was the wiser. Even our, shall we say, uh, competitor nations in atomic and missile research who were bound to keep tabs on such a man, they knew only that he was working for the Dufresne Chemical Corporation. They and that... did know that, huh? Well, we must suppose so. International espionage is pretty well organized these days. Yeah. But uh, now this disappearance, Mr. Were changes in plans for nuclear developments had made it mandatory that he spend some time in... Uh, well, elsewhere. Where? Well, shall we say somewhere in New Mexico or something like that. 
So to openly send him there would have indicated to our competitors what these new developments could be. That had to be avoided at any cost. Therefore, the plan for his disappearance was carefully worked out and carried out. Then whose body was it we picked up? Well, some poor, unidentified old derelict who was on his way to Potter's Field. I see, I see. <laughs> well, believe me, if the Bureau functions this thoroughly in everything it does... Oh, we try. But what about Mrs. Barron? Oh, she'll bear up. We, of course, made sure of that in the beginning. And then when her dear husband does return... Well, what will that be? When his work is finished. And, of course, that'll be too late for our friends across the sea to catch up with us. And we've worked out a completely plausible story to cover his absence. Oh, I'm sure you have. Now, Dr. Dana here will return to Sarasota in the morning. He will confirm identification of the body that was fished from the sea with only uh, sufficient reservation to protect his professional reputation when Parley Barron reappears. All right. Now, what an insurance claim is filed on Barron? Well, I'm sure Mrs. Barron won't file for some time, unless urged to by your friend Poorman. No, I can prevent that without telling him anything. That's fine. What's more, with the pension that some companies have for, shall we say, slow action on claims... Well, don't let them hear you say that. Well, Barron will be back before you need to worry about it. Now, is uh, that okay with you, Mr. Dollar? Um, shall we say... Okay. And once more, I tip my hat to the FBI. Expense account total, including plane fare and incidentals back to Hartford, $421.50. Remarks? For obvious reasons, I have used fictitious names throughout this report and, of course, delayed filing it until obtaining official clearance. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now, here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a strange old character, the most beautiful girl I've ever met, and money all over the place. Counterfeit. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Jeanette Nolan, Will Wright, Barney Phillips, Lawrence Dobkin, Stacey Harris, and Harry Bartell. Musical supervision is by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverley speaking. Johnny Dollar has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.